Atheist Nomads, episode 118. News for October 29, 2015. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo haws. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. Joining me as always is a very, very sleep-deprived Wesley. Oh, He's always sleeping. Holy fuck. And Man. joining us again is my lovely wife, Lauren. Hi, everybody. And Rocco. Rocco Taco. <laughs> He yes. licked the microphone. I Rock think that counts. Rock is in her lap right now, and he will probably be back in mine again before too terribly long. He's an official guest. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, he licked the microphone. Yeah. That's a yes. Uh, and yeah, I guess we yeah, we talked a little bit beforehand, and I don't think we really have much to say about how things are going that we can say or won't be talking about more in depth later. Yeah, so fuck it. Right to the show. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so for our, our special topic, we're continuing with the Adventist history, and one of the big things that Adventists have dealt with over the years is fighting the cult label. And for, you know, to, to explain that term, since it gets thrown around a lot, uh, the proper definition of a cult is actually just a religious group, and cultic practices are just religious practices. Cultic beliefs are just religious beliefs. It is more commonly used to define anything that's not orthodox. And just a smaller group. So a Christian cult is anything that just doesn't quite fit with mainstream Christianity. And a quick way to get labeled as a cult is to not be Trinitarian, like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. They do not believe that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are all three in one. Well, early Adventists for the most part, didn't either. Uh, very early on, uh, they viewed God the Father as being the eternal being, Jesus as probably being created when conceived by Mary, and the Holy Spirit as coming after that as just God's spirit, not a, a separate being. Uh, with time that shifted, Ellen White identified him as the, the Archangel Michael, and having take an angel form when the uh, when Satan rebelled in heaven and then taking human form later on for us. And so he was the savior of the angels as an angel and then savior of the humans as a human and was God before that, but not quite equal. Uh, roughly by about the 1860s, 1870s, um, Adventists did have Jesus as fully equal God as pretty established doctrine. So they basically thought he was a demigod up until that point? Yeah. And then yeah. they're like, we want to be at the cool kid table. Well, they were still missing the Holy Spirit. Oh, okay. So well. didn't have the full Trinity yet. Uh, I actually did a paper on the development of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in the Adventist church for my uh, church history class in uh, the seminary. And I was looking back at original church publications from the 19th century. And Ellen White didn't really talk about the Holy Spirit much, definitely not as a person. Um, no other early Adventist writers even really seemed to bring it up until, like, I remember correctly, one vague reference in the 1880s, <laughs> and then a couple more references in the 1890s, including one arguing that the Holy Spirit was a separate person of God. And it seems that roughly by about the 19 teens, 1920s, it was you know, pretty well established within the Adventist church that the Trinity was, you know, a thing. Uh, the doxology, uh, praise God from whom all things come, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that wasn't like that in the Adventist hymnal until the 1950s. I, I like the dox thing. It sounds like little wiener dogs are preaching. <laughs> <laughs> it, actually, it's from the Greek. It just means the good word. Well, wiener dogs are good. Mm-hmm. Tasty. Oxens are adorable. Very tasty. And so, and actually, it might have even been the 1950s version still had the old form, and it was the eight, one in the 80s that they released that had finally had it updated. Uh, but I know by the time I was a kid, the, the doxology was very firmly 
had Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And that's only one area where the Adventists had some some difficulty with fitting in with the rest of Christians. Uh, they Let's go through their list, shall we? <laughs> they had the tendency to separate out. Uh, when they left upstate New York, they moved almost all of them to Battle, uh, to Battle Creek, Michigan. Adventists had a, a tendency as they, when they would move to all settle together in one place. And you will find this to this day where there is an Adventist institution, there will be a large Adventist population. So where there's a college, a large Adventist hospital, several Adventist owned hospitals, you will find massive amounts of Adventists. Uh, the place where you will find the most Adventists anywhere is Los Angeles. There are two Adventist universities, a massive hospital, and a handful of other hospitals all right there in the L.A. metro area. Um, Portland, you will also find a lot of Adventists because there's an Adventist hospital there. And when you isolate yourself out, um, it, it makes it a lot easier for people to think, well, you're different and you're weird. They, they, don't get a lot of, they You don't get a lot of opportunities to convince people that, oh, no, you're just the, the nice guy down the street or the nice guy that works on my teeth or that runs the hospital across the street. Uh, it's, they, they, so they had that going against them, uh, the vegetarianism and at least not eating pork, not drinking or smoking. Uh, those were all things that further isolated Adventists from the rest of the general population. We do not take kindly to strangers that do not partake of bacon. <laughs> yeah. And so it was in the 1950s that the Adventist church actually started making a concerted effort to be viewed as mainstream Christians. It was like a full-on publicity and lobbying campaign, trying to convince other Christians that they're just like them, but a little bit different. And it was actually largely successful. Uh, there, there wasn't really any resistance to Adventists getting uh, chaplains in the military. Uh, currently, the chaplain for the U.S. Senate is an Adventist. Uh, prior to that role, he was the chief of chaplain services for the uh, U.S. Navy. And at the same time, an Adventist chaplain was serving as the um, deputy chief of chaplain services for the Navy covering the reserve component. And he was actually a uh, professor of mine in college. Uh, there are Adventists that have gotten elected into public office. Uh, they have pretty well integrated into society. They just go to work on a or go to church on a different day and don't eat drink or smoke a lot of things all well, that a little bit more now than they used to yeah and it's even reached the point now where not only are adventists considered you know just kind of lumped in generally with protestant denominations uh they're starting to get lumped in with evangelicals and recently made a decision to reject a proposal to join the national i think it's national conference of of evangelicals and it would have been unheard of for Adventists to join with, you know, parts of Babylon before. <laughs> but despite that, there are still people who think those weird Adventists are just a cult. And there are actually still Adventists who are not uh, fitting in with the modern Orthodox version of Adventism. Uh, there's a, a decent portion who are still uh, not Trinitarian. That's been one of the hardest things for people to accept. And if the day comes when Adventists accept uh, evolution, uh, it will be a long time before everybody signs on to that. All right, man. Not not Trinitarian. That that's. I mean, well, good. Even, cause Trinitarianism doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. Yeah, it, it doesn't. But <laughs> how do they how do they square that circle? I mean, what are, what are they doing? Do they just say that they're actually just three people? Uh, non-Trinitarians don't think the Holy of the Holy Spirit is a person. Okay. That's just God's spirit, like his his invisible arms to reach out and touch your brain. And Jesus is uh, just viewed as the Son of God, a, a demigod, really. Uh, okay, so it's two people, not not three, then essentially. Yeah. And in some forms of non-Trinitarianism, Jesus was a man who was promoted to God. Ah. Okay. When you start looking at the different forms of non-Trinitarian Christianity, yeah, there's there's every imaginable way you can think of having God and Jesus and a Holy Spirit without thinking they're all three equals one. Uh, 
All those different possibilities do exist. All those much more logical possibilities exist. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Much more logical. Uh, the, the, the Trinity was one of the things I had the hardest time believing. It really... Uh, actually, I would say it was my one doubt that I never resolved for any period of time. All my other doubts, as I was, I was studying, I was able to resolve it at least tentatively. That one I couldn't. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and then we will be back with history. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N.com forward slash atheist nomads. This day in history, October 29th, starting, starting in 1929. So, yeah, this is a, a weird day, weird time. Uh, this is the day that the New York Stock Exchange crashes in what will later be called the Crash of 29 or Black Tuesday, ending the great bull market of the 20s and, yeah, totally beginning the Great Depression. So, and Black Tuesday has no relation to Black Friday, in case no, you're wondering. No, no. One, one really sucks, one is really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about Cyber Monday, people. Well, as long as you have money left for Monday, hey, who cares? Let's keep, keep it rolling. Keep buying, because we're good consumers. Anyways, uh, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, there was a whole bunch of uh, speculation on the market, which might have seemed kind of... Uh, like what just happened a few years ago and people were just trading and everything went to shit. What can I say? The start of the depression was quite bad. Uh, the, the market crash was bad enough that we put a lot of rules in place to make sure that couldn't happen again. Not only trying to prevent some of the poor practices that helped lead to it, like mixing of, investment banking and regular banking which that got repealed just in time for our last great recession uh, they also put in rules where the stock market would shut down if enough points were lost and that's happened quite a few times in recent history well some of the big problems with uh, 1929 was that uh, there was just giant panics um the the dow jones uh you know it it uh, had some problems. It went up and went down. It definitely did recover for a little while. But, uh, yeah, starting on the 28th, uh, Black Monday. I don't know why they have a thing for calling everything black. But, uh, man, uh, a lot of the investors were facing margin calls. And they decided to just basically dump everything and get out of the market. And, you know, the, the Dow uh, lost, uh, what was it, 38 points or 13%. Uh the next day, Black Tuesday, like I said, black things. Um, yeah, they, uh, about 16 million shares were traded as the panic uh, selling reached a crescendo. And some stocks actually had no buyers, uh, which they call air pockets, apparently. Uh, the Dow lost an additional 30 points or another 12% amid rumors that the uh, U.S. President Hubert Hoover would not veto the pending Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act. And, uh, yeah, the volume of stocks traded on October 29th was a record that wasn't broken for almost 40 years. Uh, a couple of the really rich people of the time, William Durant and the Rockefeller family actually tried to buy large quantities of stock to like, you know, show that they still had confidence in the market, but that didn't really help, man. <laughs> you know, you can try and put Febreze on a big pile of shit, but it's still going to smell like a big pile of shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the, the tickers didn't stop running until about 7.45 in the evening, which is really uncommon. And the market had lost over $30 billion, with a B, in the space of two days, which included $14 billion on October 29th alone. Which, uh, you know, back then, that, that must have been, I don't even know the exact current amount but that's got to be like trillions of dollars oh probably today yeah yeah just crazy amounts 
so yeah uh, that pretty much uh fucked the entire world over for a, quite a quite a long time mm-hmm. until women stepped up yeah women who needs them <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, literally boy. everybody literally everybody literally yeah you look at the uh this article on on uh, wikipedia has a uh awesome chart on just unemployment it quickly rose from the start of of the the crash to the uh you know like 1933 or so to over 20 percent unemployment and that was starting at around five percent dipped under 15 percent once and then world war ii started and unemployment dropped to near zero. <laughs> Every man who could fight was off fighting. Every man who couldn't was in a factory or a farm. And every woman was also in a factory or on a farm. Yeah. Yeah. No shit. Rivets. <laughs> Rosie. All right. So moving on along. This one's close to my heart. This day in history, 1942. Bob Ross, the American painter and television host, is born. Aww. Aww. It's, yeah, I know. Everybody gets that reaction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Bob Ross, he was an American painter, art instructor, television host, and he was best known for the as the creator of The Joy of Painting. It was a television program that aired on PBS in the U.S., Canada, and even Europe. Much of which uh, is now available to watch for free on YouTube, including the first ever episode. That would be oh, so nice. awesome. They I'm just released that this it. week. Oh, <laughs> I know, right? So many happy clouds. It gets it gets even interesting, uh, more odd, I'd say. Uh, most people don't know that Bob actually served twenty years in the Air Force, and uh, it was when he was up in uh, Eisen, Eisel's, Eielson Air Force Base up in Alaska that uh, you know he got all of the the great views of snow peaked mountains and trees and stuff that would later become like you know totally recurring themes in his artwork hmm. uh, he, that's when he also developed his quick painting technique to create art for sale uh when he had like little breaks when he was working uh interesting interesting side note his perm was actually a cost saving measure because he was so break broke when the show started and it just later became a staple and kind of had to keep it even though he didn't like it <laughs> yeah so if you ever hear anybody talk about happy little trees it's because of this guy it's, oh look at those happy little trees as he painted it. i just love him oh let's, bob let's let's that's okay there's no such things as mistakes let's just make this a a, a happy cloud yes <laughs> let's make this a happy cloud <laughs> oh yeah he oh, wanted he was to fantastic after the Air Force, he wanted to never have a job where he had to shout ever again. So, yeah. Yeah, because apparently he, he was like uh, like the mean guy, right? He was the yeah. bully. Yeah, well, he was made to be. I mean, that was yeah. his position. That yeah. was the position. Those people that you always <laughs> see in war movies that are like yelling at the cadets. <laughs> yeah. yeah, by the time he retired, or at least at one point, he was the first sergeant of a Air Force clinic. Mm -hmm. yeah, granted, you probably aren't going to be yelling much at a clinic, but... Yeah. His earlier roles uh, as an NCO, there would have been a lot of yelling. <laughs> and all he wanted to do was paint clouds and trees Aww. and birds. As happy as clouds. Happy. Everybody happy should trees. be more like Bob Ross. Totally. This world with, you know, less religion, more Bob Ross. This would be an awesome world. He makes an awesome Halloween costume as well. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So, this day in history, 1960. In Louisville, Kentucky, Cassius Clay, who later becomes Muhammad Ali, wins his first professional fight. So I'm not going to get into all the politics. Uh, yeah, I will say that uh, Cassius, later Ali, uh, converted to uh, Sunni Muslim in, in his 20s, as I recall. But uh, that aside, uh, Ali, yeah, made his professional debut in on October 29th, 1960, and uh, he ended up winning a six-round decision over Tunney Hunsaker. Uh, from then to the end of 1963, Clay got a record of 19-0 and zero with 15 wins by knockout. God damn. The, um, I don't know how many people know this, uh, but it was kind of actually a shock to me. Uh, 
he actually won the uh, gold in Rome's 1960 Olympics in the light heavyweight. I never knew that he was in the Olympics. Hmm. But uh, yeah, overall, uh, total fight, 61. Wins, 56. Wins by KO, 37. And only five losses. So, god damn. Yeah, he was kind of toted as the uh, America's pride, pride and joy for quite a bit of his career. It's kind of funny that, you know, back then, being a Muslim, I guess, didn't stop that. But um, I wonder if that would happen nowadays. I wonder if people liked him less because he was Muslim or he was black. Mm. It's a double hitter. I doubt it would have really made much of a difference there. Not, Not in boxing, honestly. And not at that time period. Muslims weren't hated as much until the 80s. Not hated as much, but uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm betting a lot of uh, old white people were voting against, well, betting against him when he was fighting a white guy. Oh, sure of it. But man, oh man. Yeah, dude seriously kicks some ass. Yeah. Yeah, later in his life, he... Uh, oh, he punched faces, really. He actually lived in Berrien Sorry. Springs, Michigan, where yeah. Andrews University is. Uh-huh. And he sold his home there in uh, January 2007, which actually okay. was when I was there. Mm-hmm. And I remember that winter, and I can't say I blame him. <laughs> <laughs> All of the snow melted, got up to 40 degrees, it was a beautiful sunny day, and then the temperature started to drop, and the snow started to fall. And by morning, there was three feet of snow, and it was zero degrees. You know, a man can handle getting punched in the head repeatedly, but he can't handle three feet of snow in one night. It's like He's like, fuck this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not worth it. <laughs> Moved to Kentucky and is now in Scottsdale, Arizona. Oh, yes. See? Warm. Mm. This day in history, 1997, Anton LaVey dies. Uh, yeah, so you might know him as the, uh, the guy that's impersonating Bing the Merciless but not on purpose. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> or like else, Fu Manchu. <laughs> or else you might know him as the founder of the Church of Satan. Uh, yeah. So that guy. Yeah, kind of an odd duck, you might say. He was an American author, carnival and circus performer, uh, musician, and occultist. Uh, like I said, he found it, founded the Church of Satan and the religion... Uh, the Levian Satanism, and it's totally separate from the Satanic Temple. Like uh, we uh, interviewed Lucian Greaves a while back, totally separate. So I'm taking one is satire, one is not. Uh, one is used for to good ends, the other is just uh, people role playing. Oh, yeah, that's what I'd say. But uh, yeah, I actually wrote quite a few books, uh, five or six books, and it turned out that. Some people called him the father of Satanism, the black Pope, and the evilest man alive. Yeah, weird. I mean, he looks the part, but <laughs> he was an actor oh, too, so. I mean, <laughs> Max von Sydow must have gotten all of his like character tips, all of his uh, makeup tips for being the merciless from Anton for, for Flash Gordon. Uh, just it's just betting. too perfect. It is awesome. All right. I know there was a comic back in like the 30s or something, Flash Gordon, but still, Anton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, what else? What else? Oh, yeah. Hey. Uh, this day in history, 1998. Uh, space shuttle Discovery blasts off on the uh, STS-95 with the 77-year-old John Glenn on board. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, that made him by far the oldest man to go into space. And he was a setting senator at the time. How weird is that? Yeah. Man, oh, man. Well, I guess they're not going to say no. (laughs) Sorry, you're a senator. You really need to stay on Earth. Well, they actually wanted to test test him, like, see how it is to be an old person in Mm -hmm. space. So I bet it's very, very nice for the uh, joints. Uh, very nice for the joints i'm sure you know i'm sure that his old saggy man balls weren't as nearly hanging to his knees so you know hey good for him that's just hanging right there i like it yeah anyways just, just gonna <laughs> let that one slide a couple of interesting tidbits he was a former u.s marine aviator an engineer 
an astronaut and a senator. Yeah, he definitely living a full ass life. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the death of Edward Brooke on January 3rd, 2015, Glenn became the oldest living former United States senator. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, still still breaking records. There you Wait, go. Wait, oldest living previous Senate. Form, oh, old, Strom living Thurmond. Former. He was a House, right? No, he was yeah. Senate, but he died. Oh, right. So, oh, currently living yeah, oldest. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yep. Strom Thurmond was, yeah. Like, why like, is this something to celebrate? <laughs> all right, we will take another quick break, and then we'll be back with science. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. Little warning out there. We're basically going to be talking about magic. Um, Yay! Magic is something that helps explain certain phenomenon that we do not, we cannot understand, and that is basically quantum physics. Um, anybody who tells you that they understand quantum physics is lying to your face. Um, do not buy their books. However, if they do tell you that the, even they don't know what's going on, they're probably a professor, and you should probably listen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this week, it was proven that uh, a, a theory, a quantum the uh, theory prediction that systems can't change while being watched has been proven correct. So, some news places with horrible headlines, don't get me started, um, decided <laughs> that this is now going to be called the weeping angel effect. So, when you're looking at it, it can't move. It can't change. It's not weeping angel. It has a name of its own. It's called the Zeno effect. So, Shut up. Yeah, anyway, Doctor Who reference. Come I on. know, and I love Doctor Who, but oh, don't dumb it down, people. Anyway, so <laughs> you Adams, have to dumb down quantum Adams physics. Adams can't move while they're being watched, and they proved this by super cooling an atom down to point zero 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 one degree above Kelvin. So that's absolute zero, basically. And they use lasers, and they use all sorts of really cool things to get these atoms to stop moving. Uh, basically, the atom can move about an inch in two hours, mm -hmm. which for an atom is nothing. It's amazing. Not only that, but it glows too. So you can actually visibly see like this little light that is an atom. It's really cool. Mm. Um, this was done at Cornell's ultra cold lab because it's freaking cold. And um, yeah, I cannot wrap my mind around this idea that if you're looking at something in a quantum state, it can't move or change. But how does it know that you're looking at it? And what? God. what? So like, were they seeing it at one point and then they'd look away and then they'd see it at the other point? Well, okay. So that kind of makes sense in, in the way that movies make sense. If you look at it frame per frame, it looks like it's not moving. But when you put a whole bunch of those observations together, it forms a moving picture. So, but this isn't that. This is something else. This is, it physically, it, systems cannot change while they're being observed, whether they're being observed over just like an instantaneous or they're being observed over long term, I guess. So if this is the case, if you want to stop a out of control nuclear reaction. Look at it. Everybody, just just look right into that bright light. Just stare it down. No, oh, but then you'd be blinded, and it would <gasps> then it wouldn't be observed, so it could start up again. Oh my gosh! The tree does fall in the woods. Anyway, oh, and, and by observed, like was it only a factor if people were paying attention to the observations, or if equipment was recording it? I have no idea. That's where this definitely gets into um, technical know-how. You really have to understand the process, which I don't. And I don't think most people out there do, but these guys that were doing this, they, they specialize in just getting atoms to slow down as much as possible so they can observe them. And what they found is that the slower the atom, the more that the atom is likely to act under classical physics. So if you push it with some laser, it will, it will you know, 
the force will cause it to move, that kind of traditional thing. Um, but when you're looking at something that small, there's a lot of sub subatomic particles, quantum stuff going on too. And that's the stuff that's just like magic. We don't know why it does that. And we don't know why it stops moving when we look at it. But we'll figure it out someday and it will cease to be magic. But for right now, it's magic. Sweet. Yes. And yeah, the Weeping Angels thing. I, I told, That's what I thought when I read it. I seriously was like, oh, it's like the Weeping Angels. And then the next day I saw that in the headline and it made me so mad. <laughs> seriously, bullshit headline of the week, people. Okay, next. What is blacker than black? Black. It's pretty metal. Black, black. Actually, it's not metal, but it is based off of actually a Beatles carapace. This hmm. is really cool. Blackest material ever made. Uh, it was done at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, where they have lots of money and are very interested in creating very black materials. <laughs> um, for better hijabs? For better hijabs, or yes. Niqabs? Niqabs, uh, yeah. No, actually for better solar panels, oh, Okay. for example. I can definitely see why they'd want to invest in this. So there's this beetle called the white scarab. And uh, basically, instead of having traditional plates, it has this weird membrane like spaghetti that's been all stuck together. And that causes light to reflect at in a superb way. I mean, it is the whitest natural thing in the world, this little beetle. So what they did is they approached this by saying, well, what would what would, happens if we were to invert this idea? Um, don't know really how they came about this invert thing, but what they came up with was a nanoparticle. Two nanoparticles. One was a rod shape, and the other one was a sphere, and basically they're stuck together. And so no matter where you're looking at this particle, no matter what angle and no wonder what polarization... It is absorbing 98 to 99 percent visible light. This is really badass. It is basically 26 percent darker than anything that's ever been made before. Whoa. So, like all those Norwegian metal folk, need to start writing about this because this is this is black. This is metal. <laughs> um. So that I mean, I remember something interesting happening out a couple of years ago. It was also like the blackest material ever made. Um, but this is this is definitely up the ante. Twenty six percent darker than anything else. That's like oh, that's really cool. And uh, the shape, when you think about it, makes a lot of sense when you try to imagine looking at it from different perspectives. A sphere, I thought would have been enough, but you got to have that little rod on it too. It's really cute. Cool. If you think nanoparticles are cute. And lastly, we're going to be talking about um, something that really caught my eye because it's a different. Uh, approach to making the earth a better place. All right. So this is really important. Um, there's this thing called the Buckminster Fuller challenge, which I hold very near and dear to my heart. I named my dog after Buckminster Fuller because he's awesome. Um, but this challenge is basically like a mil is like a million dollar challenge kind of thing. And the winner this year is a, a company called Green Wave. Green Wave. And it's a way to uh, it's, a, it's a way to develop multi-species aqua farming. So typically what we do to get fish is we trawl. So we have this big net that goes on the bottom of the ocean, and then they just drag it along and pick up whatever they can, throw away everything that they don't want, and then take the fish back. This destroys everything in its path. And it's really bad, and this is why we have overfishing problems with tuna and salmon and everything. Basically, we're just decimating everything within like 12 miles of a coast mm -hmm. trying to catch these fish. Um, this is particularly bad for uh, mussels, scallops, and, um, you know, those kind of uh, single muscle uh, shelled creatures. Can't think of the name of them off the top of my head. But because those are also farmed in a way that they have all these shells and all these creatures just laying in the bottom of this uh, sandy area, wait for them to grow up, and then they just trawl the whole thing and start over. Well, there's this, this, there's no ecosystem here. It's sterile. It's dead. So what this guy came up with, and it's really cool. They have um, an image showing this on the link that I, that I shared, uh, the techexplore.com shows. And basically what it is, it's a series of layers of kelp with socks and baskets in between that are growing the mussels and the scallops and and those little creatures. So the kelp is helping feed the, the 
the muscles, the muscles are pooping and that stuff goes down to the bottom and that stuff is being eaten by fish and the fish like that. And then they can go down and have, they have fish traps instead of fish trawls. And this way they're able to grow six or seven species of seafood, tons of kelp, which is, which we use for just about everything nowadays, by the way. Um, you're pretty much going to start seeing it in restaurants here pretty soon, I swear. Uh, hmm. And it creates an ecosystem that doesn't damage the surrounding ocean at all. Uh, everything's anchored in one place, but it's also producing food and bacteria and algae and all those good things that's, ne- that's needed to maintain an ecosystem. I can see why this guy won, because it's freaking genius. Um, instead yeah. of destroying the ocean that we depend on, let's kind of like, just kind of compartmentalize it. And keep it thriving. Uh, it's called 3D Aqua Farming, and it's um, it's huge, people. It's awesome. So, yeah, that's it for science oh, and technology. Cool. Now, before we leave Sweet. this section, uh, I do want to talk about one story that's been getting a lot of attention, <clears throat> and this is the World Health Organization's report that processed meat is a carcinogen, and that red meat is possibly a carcinogen. So, quiet down, vegetarians, vegans. It's wait for it it puts it about on scale with say like colorectal cancer uh everybody has about a five percent chance of getting that typically that's butt cancer by the way yes if you eat a hot dog a day that might kick you up to a six percent chance and really gross guys slight increase if you eat this stuff in moderation there's no problem a high bacon diet is not a good idea Not only is that bad for your rectum, it is bad for your heart and just about everything else. Uh, The same thing is true for just about all processed meats. Uh, Red meat, same thing. If you eat a ton of it, you're not going to be healthy. But if you eat it in moderation, you will be fine. So stop freaking the fuck out. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't really that big of a deal, but somebody at the WHO decided to... uh, it's the way they presented it to the media that was um, considered the bad headline on this one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I take back what I said earlier about the Weeping Angels. That at least, you know, made logical sense. This is the bad headline of the week. This was, <laughs> bacon will cause cancer. The the WHO put it on the list of known carcinogens, which includes alcohol, cigarettes, exhaust, polluted air, and a ton of other things. Moderation. Moderation. All right, we are going to go ahead and move on to politics and religion after a quick break. As a listener of the show, I'm going to assume you love my sexy vocal stylings. If you love the rest of the show as much as my voice, consider giving us the resources we desperately need to purchase quality cocaine and Red Bull. We make it super easy to make a one-time donation or to support us on a per episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. A dollar an episode is all we ask. I'm sure you all remember Hobby Lobby and the Green family from their Supreme Court case that they won. Motherfuckers. (laughs) Uh, But they're back in the news, uh, this time uh, for some really illegal stuff. Uh, They have had uh, two to three hundred thousand... they had two to three hundred cuneiform tablets shipped from Israel in 2011, Whoa. and these were likely stolen from Iraq during the Iraq War. Right. Do you think they put Mod Podge on it? Um, <laughs> well, they put it. They they had the customs declaration with this, and they said that it was tile samples worth about three hundred dollars. <laughs> Assuming these were legal, uh, they would have been worth far more than that, and would have cost a lot more than that. Um, There is procedures and processes to allow you to legally import antiquities from countries. One of the key things is that country has to say it's okay. Iraq did not in this case. In fact, Hmm. this was during the time that they're trying to recover all of this stuff Uh post-decimation. Yeah, and they're getting further decimated now by the fucking Islamic State. Uh, These uh, tablets are or at least were supposed to be destined for the Museum of the Bible that the Green family is funding and scheduling to have opened in 2017 in Washington, D.C. 
just a few blocks from the U.S. Capitol. <laughs> and Steve Green claims to be ignorant of any wrongdoing with this, says that he thought it was all uh, legit, but wouldn't be surprised if there was some something illegal that had gone on, just that he wasn't aware of it. Uh, despite that, um, he actually met with Patty Gersten Blith, a law professor with a focus on cultural heritage, things like how to import antiquities, and discussed with her how to correctly and legally import antiquities. This meeting was in 2010, the year before this shipment. So he knew exactly how to do it right, how to document it right, and how to not do it right, and had somebody ship stuff Three hundred dollars worth of tile samples, <laughs> man. At at the at a, at the least, his his little Bible museum is gonna just look like shit and gonna have tons of blank walls, which I hope. At the <laughs> best, I really want to see him charged with some shit and or at least you know brought up with tons of uh, you know uh, he needs to pay taxes on all this stuff on on the actual value of all this stuff. What what would happen is he'd get fined because it's illegal and he's not supposed to have them. And then they get confiscated. They get confiscated, yeah, and returned yeah. back to their orig their their country of origin. Kind of like uh, the Nazis taking all the art and gold mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah. The unfortunate thing is they have billions of dollars. Yeah. The fine's not going to matter. Kind of depends on the scale. Yep. These are you, priceless antiques, I would think. Unfortunately, you can't. They aren't allowed to do big enough fines to make it hurt. And moving on, David Hickman was born September 26, 2009. He weighed three pounds, seven ounces. Mm. He was born two months early. He was so small that family members had to make hand make diapers for him to get them small enough down. And they had to get the breast milk from his mother into a spoon and then drip it into his mouth. Damn. Literally too small to suck on a tit. His parents were members of the Followers of Christ Church in Oregon City and faith healers. So they kept him home. He was born at home. His mom had no prenatal care. And nine hours after he was born, he died of Staphylococcus pneumonia. Huh. Nine hours. Uh, if he had been taken to the hospital and gotten proper treatment, he would have had a 99% chance of survival. For a baby that premature, without that treatment, there's not even a 1% chance of survival. That's, that's pretty much guaranteed death. You know, babies don't have functioning immune systems when they're born, but they at least have the ability to create one. Their organs function. A baby born that early doesn't have that. The development isn't complete. Uh, that's why premature babies go into the neonatal intensive care until they would reach the point of being full term, and then they actually get released because they need that much special care and attention and treatment just to stay alive because they just aren't well enough developed to be out in this world. Uh, his parents, uh, thanks to Oregon's religious shield laws being taken off the books, were convicted of manslaughter in 2011. Sweet. And they were sentenced to a six-year, three-month sentence. Not enough. They then appealed this ruling on religious freedom grounds, mm. and they claimed that under Oregon's Constitution, which has a stronger protection of religious freedom than the U.S. Constitution, that the state had to prove that they knew that their religious practices would cause their child to die. Uh, what's kind of difficult there is there are always two standards with any laws that involve needing to know things. There is what you do know, and there's what you should know. And you can be found guilty of something that requires that you know about things or would imply that you would need to know about it if you should have known. Like if it was your responsibility to know that. You know, a manager who doesn't know about serious problems going on under his or her watch, say sexual harassment, can get uh, be found liable for that on the grounds of that being something that this person should know. 
And in this case, parents should know that a two-month premature child needs to go to the doctor, needs medical care. That is a thing that you should know. You shouldn't have children and be ignorant to what it takes to, you know, keep a, a newborn alive. And fortunately, uh, the Oregon State Supreme Court basically had that as their ruling. They should have known. Ignorance is not an excuse. Their child would have survived if it hadn't been for their belief that, that God would save him and ruled against them. So they have to serve out the rest of their sentence. Well, I'm very glad to hear that their, you know, their religious beliefs are, are you know, being held up to a magnifying glass and that they're being held accountable. It's about damn time. Especially since uh, Oregon took out their religious exemption in what, 2010, 2011? Something like that. It's been a while. All right. Now, this next story is a, a bit close to home for you, Wesley, so I will let you take it. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to use the, the I'm going to say the thing that nobody should ever say and say that pretty much everybody's heard of uh, assistant coach uh, Joe Kennedy. He's a football coach out here in Bremerton, Washington, in my almost literally almost literally my back door. Yeah. Uh, at, at your your high school, right? Yeah, former high school. Yeah, I'm I'm an alum of the Bremerton High School. Man, so this guy, he's he's got this uh, love of praying at the 50-yard line after the game, and he's been doing it for a long time. Somebody finally complained about this uh, month, a little over a month and a half ago, I guess. Uh, there was there's actually an atheist uh, football player and uh, many other atheists in the area. Go figure. Uh, there was actually a Gallup poll from 2013 that said that Kitsap County, this county, is actually the most uh, irreligious place in the nation. So it's not a surprise that there are, you know, non-believers all up and down this area. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so yeah, Joe Kennedy, uh, the school board came out and gave a letter, said that, you know what, you need to stop praying at the 50 because all of the players would actually huddle around him when he prayed. And you know what? Not allowed. Um, yeah, because that really sounds like the district is is endorsing this prayer. Yeah, because I mean, a district employee is leading students in prayer on school property. So yeah, I mean we've ha we've had this argument many times before. Te can teachers pray in the classroom? And it's always no. He's so yeah. You got a coach. He's an instructor. Instructors can't pray with their students. Uh, where's the big fucking disconnect here? There but, are places they can, and that's at private Christian schools. Sure, but this is a standard barnyard, uh, run-of-the-mill fucking public public school. So, yeah. Um, and you know what? For a while, it seemed like after the school district came out and said that, you know, he shouldn't pray, uh, he didn't. At least not, not during the game, and everything was good then the liberty institute from texas got involved and well they bolstered bolstered him up and he's been on fox news a whole bunch of times and other shit and he's uh he's actually talked about suing the school district for accommodation so that he can pray and you know what yeah that's kind of fucked up i, I kind of irked about this i've uh actually <laughs> been out on the field while he's praying uh sometimes aloud sometimes silently and you know what no the shit's not right and i'm helping do something about that yeah you've you've gotten in the news with this oh yeah i've actually been on uh local cbs station local fox station and yeah it's uh i've actually uh, been called a nazi by a manager in my government shipyard whoa uh, <laughs> yeah that was interesting your manager or no a, a separate manager over facebook he sent me a friend request and yeah uh we had a, a little talk privately and called me a nazi i was like huh all right interesting wow uh you know you could report that to hr yeah i could i probably should but i haven't uh wow. i've also had a a friend of mine tell me that my face my picture and uh 
you know, information had been posted up on another private Facebook page and got told to harass me. So that was interesting also. But, uh, wow. Enough about me. Um, this fucking poser is, um, breaking the law. And you know what? His good guy rep is, I'm taking it away because he's a fucking dick. He keeps on saying this is all about the kids and that, you know, he, he just wants to be a, a good coach and help them grow up. But you know what? No matter what, the school district and by extension, the kids are going to lose on this. Either by, either by somebody suing the school district to make him stop or by him su- suing the school district. Mm-hmm. The only people that are going to win are the fucking lawyers. Yeah. And not just the school and the kids. You as a taxpayer will lose. Oh, yeah, because I'm going to have to foot that fucking bill. Yeah, me and thousands of, of my neighbors. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, assistant coach Joe Kennedy, you're a fucking douchebag. So, uh, now, I, I've seen a, a few places around the internet that the Satanic, satanic Temple is uh, going to get involved now. Yeah. Um, our local branch of the Satanic Temple out of Seattle is going to come over on uh, during the next game and uh, they're going to hold an invocation. So, yay, satanic prayer at Brampton High School football field. Hooray. Uh, this We're actually going to go speak at the Bremerton High School uh, uh, Council here in a couple days on Thursday. And then right after that, I will attend the game and watch the prayer. So yeah, wow. boy, oh boy. On the flyer, I actually got one on my car. Uh, it says the Satanic Temple offers October 29th post-game Satanic Invocation at Burlington High School football field. School, excuse me, <clears throat> school staff in positions of authority should not be leading prayers with students on school grounds. When Coach Joe Kennedy makes a point to bring Christianity to student events, he is making the 50-yard line a Christian church. If one religion is represented, All are legally entitled to equal access, including Satanism. We include any staff or student member of the Burlington High School to contact us to perform a satanic invocation at your October 29th football game. And uh, gives an email address, which is satanictempleseattle at gmail.com. Post game, 50 yard line, hail Satan. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Yeah. So, um, you know what? Uh, fucking a, I, I really appreciate what the Satanists are doing because either they, either the Satanists put pressure on the school district and they say, no, nobody's going to pray, which that's a win for the Satanists and for everybody. Uh, or do you know what they say? Okay. They're not, they're going to hold off and say nothing essentially and, and let Joe pray. Then by all rights, uh, the, the Satanists have to get in and have their prayer heard as well. Otherwise, uh, BHS is, you know, again, saying that they favor one religion over another, Mm -hmm. but you know what, if the Satanists get out there and they pray, then fucking a, that's a win for them also, because it's going to get in the news and it's going to piss Christians off to, to to no end. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the Satanists are the, the easiest way to teach Christians, uh, church state separation. I love this. Damn right. (laughs) So, yeah, if you don't want to have those uh, black hooded hoodlums out there, all you Christians, then you better tell Joe to, well, knock it off. (laughs) All right. Well, good luck. Yeah, goodness. This has been going on for far too long. All right. Uh, Something else that's been going on too long is Ben Carson's campaign. Ooh. And... Depending on which poll you look at, he's either now in first or second place for the Republican nomination. Well, he went on Meet the Press recently, and I uh, grabbed a bit of the audio from that interview, and I'm going to go ahead and play it now. We've allowed the purveyors of division to make mothers think that that baby is their enemy and that they have a right to kill it. Can you see how perverted that line of thinking is? What if somebody has an unwanted pregnancy? Should they have the right to terminate it? No. Think about this. Uh, During slavery, and I know that's one of those words you're not supposed to say, but I'm saying it. During slavery, a lot of the slave owners thought 
that they had the right to do whatever they wanted to that slave, anything that they chose to do. And, uh, you know, what if the abolitionist had said, you know, I don't believe in slavery. I think it's wrong. But you guys do whatever you want to do. Where would we be? Uh, then to that end, the other day in an interview, you would not say whether you were in favor of repealing Roe v. Wade. Do you want to see Roe v. Wade overturned? Ultimately, I would love to see it overturned. And that means all abortions illegal, or is there still an exception that you would have? I'm a reasonable person, and if people can uh, come up with a reasonable uh, explanation of why they would like to kill a baby, I'll listen. Life and health of the mother? Uh, again, that's an extraordinarily rare situation. Uh, but if in that very rare situation it occurred, I believe there's room to discuss that. Rape and incest? Uh, rape and incest, I would not be in favor of killing a baby because the baby came about in that way. And all you have to do is go and look up the many stories of people who have led very useful uh, lives who were the result of rape or incest. He, he says he's a reasonable person and yet is calling fetuses babies and pregnant women slave owners. None of that is, is reasonable. It's, that's hyperbolic language. He also said that uh, <clears throat> slave owners used to tell slaves what to do. Uh, <laughs> you know what? And so in this case, he's the slave owner telling women yeah. what to do. Yeah. Or like, I, 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 he's the person in the in the position of authority telling women what to do. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, am, I know I'm tired. I'm, I'm I'm totally out of it. But don't you see something wrong with that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That seems a bit odd. Why can't women do what they want to do with their bodies? Yeah, there's there's that. There's the fact that he's calling a fetus a baby. Uh, normal people don't call it a baby until it's been born. And everyone's in agreement that parents can't kill their children. Most people are in agreement that you can't abort past viability because at that point it's pretty reasonable to call it a baby. If you have the, the choice between a, you know, inducing labor, doing a C-section or an abortion, yeah, you could, that's pretty fair to call it a, a baby since that abortion would require, in most cases, uh, removing, you know, having some form of birth happening. So, yeah, in that case, yeah, we can call it a baby. Prior to that, it's a collection of cells, not much different than a tumor. Yeah. That's not a baby. When a mother's life is in jeopardy and that's really where you can tell if somebody is completely nuts or you might be able to reason with them is whether or not they think abortion should be allowed when the mother's life is is at risk because a non-viable pregnancy or a pregnancy that is not yet viable and the mother's health and safety is at risk means the mother will die if they don't abort or if they don't do something that will also require aborting. And if the mother dies, guess what? So does the fetus. That is the, the, the one case where you could, everybody reasonably should say, yes, an abortion is the right thing to do in that situation. Not even just that it's okay to do, but that it is the right thing to do. God fucking damn. <laughs> and what's, what's hilarious here is Ben Carson is an Adventist. The Adventist church is actually pro-choice. They aren't really comfortable with the idea of using abortion as birth control. So generally not really a f in favor of aborting because it's an unwanted pregnancy. Uh, the Adventist church is supportive of abortion in cases of rape and incest and completely supportive when the mother's life is at risk. When my mom was pregnant with me, she kept it secret from everybody because the Adventist family I was born into and the church they were a part of would have said that she needed to get an abortion because of what her doctors had told her during her cancer treatment. The risk was believed to be too high. 
And he is going whole hog off the conservative deep end. This guy is insane. He also has to keep up with Trump. I mean, Trump is by far the leader right now. So if he wants to even have a, a, a chance of having double digit numbers, then, you know, he needs to fucking out idiot Trump. Well, he's, he's either insane, which I kind of lean towards, or, uh, he is brilliant, which the, the degree in, you know, the fact that he was one of the world's top pediatric neurosurgeons would kind of support that he might be a brilliant person. I'm not saying uh, he's not smart. He is, if that is the case, he is very deviously playing to the most extreme part of the conservative base and it's working. I believe it's just, he's acting like this because he is actually high all of the time. <laughs> it, I mean, you can see it on his face. You can never actually see his eyeballs. No, he, he just is filled with the love of Jesus. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. Now for a presidential candidate saying something reasonable, uh, let's listen to Bernie Sanders and a, a clip from when he was on Jimmy Kimmel Live. And he was asked whether or not he believes in God. He said, God forbid, uh, do you, are you say you're culturally Jewish, you, are, you don't feel uh, religious. Do you believe in God and do you think no. that's important to the people of the well, United you know, States? I am who I am and what I believe in and what my spirituality is about is that we're all in this together. That I think it is not a good thing to believe that as human beings we can turn our backs on the suffering of other people. That we should not be living... You know, and, and this is not Judaism, this is what Pope Francis is talking about, that we cannot worship just billionaires in the making of more and more money. Life is more than that. That we are living in a nation today which has seen a proliferation of millionaires and billionaires, massive income and wealth inequality. And you know what? We have the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth. We are the only major country on earth that doesn't guarantee health care to all people as a right. The only country that doesn't have paid family and medical leave. Many other countries are providing free tuition in their public colleges and universities. So essentially what I think is we do best as human beings. We fulfill our lives when we work together rather than say, hey, I want it all and I don't care about the hungry kid down the street. I don't think that's what America should be about. God damn, that sure sounds like humanism to me. I just want to hear this shit. I want to hear the same as, God damn it. I would love to hear basically every candidate say the essentially the same thing. That it's basically nobody's business. It doesn't yeah. matter. It shouldn't be part of the debate. Fuck it. Move on. Yeah. And But, but for all that, I loved his answer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and... Every candidate should be saying that what they're there to do is to make people's lives better. That that's what motivates them. Yeah. Ah, man, this was, this was good. Yeah, fucking A. And I think he did a good job of, of explaining why that shouldn't disqualify him from running. But basically the whole interview was about whether or not he was electable. And we moved on, we moved from one hopefully very electable man to a completely unelectable <laughs> woman oh yes oh, uh nbc 24 in toledo ohio interviewed one of their mayoral candidates opal covey oh poor opal i feel sorry for the reporter that <laughs> had to do this i'm guessing they drew straws for it well let's listen to how some of that went oh no Great destruction will come up upon the Papa Hashataya, Kulia Simahai, and the Holy Antia Kiko Kulia Nasai. Ye ma sandala di di I see Koshantala Lolosi. Ye ma sandala di 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 I see Koshantaya. Thank you, Jesus. That was a confirmation. If people don't give me what I earned in 2013 back, and I'm not on that seat in November, then you'll see God coming and visiting the city in the greatest destruction you have ever seen. So is it any surprise that she hasn't been elected in the five times that she's been running? Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, she was, she claimed that she actually won the 2013 election. 
Satan. But it was it was taken away. It was stolen from her. Satan, definitely. Yeah, uh, it's it's this is if I was in Toledo, I'd be scared because <laughs> she's saying that God's destruction will come down. This is Toledo, Ohio. It is already as shitty as a place can be. <laughs> there's not many ways that it could be made worse. And there's not much in terms of natural disasters that can happen. A small tornado, perhaps, but they aren't at high risk of earthquakes or hurricanes. They might get a little bit of flooding, but that's usually pretty localized. I think she's trying to set up the cover to torch the city. Oh. I'll say, oh, I, I, I warned you. God, it's, it's God's punishment. So why do we keep finding Bic lighters <laughs> with your campaign slogan on them? Oh, great. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Uh, this is actually something I found on 13abc.com. I uh, believe it's one of their local stations there. So that, uh, according to Lucas County Board of Elections in the last mayoral primary, she garnered 142 votes out of nearly 24,000 total. In 2009, <laughs> she actually got 254 votes. 2005, 111. In 2001, a whole 23 votes. And sure, this is like a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of a fraction of a percent that people are voting for her. It still worries me that people are fucking voting for her. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Come on. What the fuck? Oh, you poor woman that needs to be in a straight jacket. Yeah. Yeah. She has these amazing posters, though. Uh, I mean, sure, she's all fire and brimstone, but uh, if you read her sign, it says, Want a pot of gold? Vote Opal Covey for mayor. A miracle worker. Her, her plan to fix the city is to patch up the potholes and build amusement parks. Sure. <laughs> amusement parks, plural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. In Toledo. Build it. They will come. Ah, the field man. of dreams. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, poor woman. Uh, fucking nutter. Lock, uh, yeah, she needs medication. All right. Well, we didn't have much in terms of feedback, yep. uh, but you can always email us at contact at atheistnomads.com or you can call us at 541-203-0666. You can hit us up on Facebook, facebook.com slash atheistnomads or tweet us at atheistnomads. And don't forget to use the Amazon click through on our website. It's always appreciated and you'll never see a difference in price when you purchase stuff. <laughs> and uh, we haven't had any new patrons in a while, so uh, we, we, we need some, some love. It's fresh blood, man. Uh-huh. Babies, fresh blood. Come on, help us. Uh, Patreon.com slash Atheist Nomads, or go to AtheistNomads.com, and you can find the Patreon and PayPal buttons on the right-hand side of the page. Um, very convenient for you to give us money on a per-episode, monthly, annual, or one-time basis using those buttons yeah <laughs> and next week we'll be back at you with a special episode mm -hmm. it won't be an interview it will be us and our significant others talking to you about mental health yeah good times yay yeah <laughs> this will be interesting <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. Theme music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads. Just on a side note, I used to think that Viewers Like You was actually the name of a corporation because, <laughs> nice. man, they funded everything on PBS. I thought, surely this must be a big corporation. No, I've, oh. I've wisened up. <laughs> Somebody needs to create Viewers Like You Incorporated. <laughs> yes, and they'll just donate just a couple dollars to like a whole bunch of things. Like a, a PBS supporting uh, super PAC. Yes, I like mm. this. Run with it.